This, this is the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Find us on air, online, on mobile, and on your smart speaker. Please subscribe at ourautoexpert.com. Our Auto Expert. 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 Now, here's the host of Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert. Nick Miles. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast. This is the World's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on smartphone, or on smart speaker. This is our Auto Expo, where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen, who rode in an electric car today, Jen. I know, and she actually liked it, which yeah. is kind of freaky. It's because you've never really heard, well, you've heard of the brand, but you've never really seen or played with one. No, this is the first time. It's a Polestar, Polestar 2. It's uh, Volvo's electric performance brand. Um, and it was interesting. First thing up, you should mention this. I should mention this. No key. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, there's a fob, but no start-stop button. Mm-mm. That we can find. <laughs> I haven't spent, I only got the car delivered yesterday morning and I haven't spent much time. But no start stop button, which is a bit weird. Um, just got in the vehicle and uh, you sit in the seat and then it starts mm-hmm. uh, with a fob in your pocket. Then you drive and you get out and you lock it and it turns off. Yeah, it's pretty bit, weird. bit creeped out by that. Like, who's watching me? It's like there's a guy in the sky with a satellite gun. He's out, turn it off. <laughs> <laughs> Have a look. <laughs> Uh, it's very Nordic, though. Isn't it Nordic? It's yeah. very Scandinavian. Yeah, I, I love the colors. Yeah, because they're Steeler colors. All right. let's get are. that. Let's get this out there right now. Because <laughs> I like it because it's gray and yellow, and it's Steeler colors. It's black, gray, and yellow. Yeah. And then the seat belts match the brakes yeah. in that yellow color. Okay, we're over the Steeler colors now. Can we move on? has really nice wood inlay mm-hmm. that's darkened black. Yeah. Gray. Steeler colors, yeah. We mm-hmm. done, we done now. And it has a touch light. It's really cool. It That's nothing in. to do with the Steelers, thank God. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's it's a good job. Um, yeah, pack show today. Are we over the Steelers now? Can we move on? Nah, sure. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank God for that. Uh, yeah. uh, pack show today. Standing by <laughs> is uh, Russell Dads. We're going to talk about Volvo's uh, electric stroke. Uh, what? You waving at me? Did I do something wrong already? No. All right. Just all right. Standing by is Russell Dads. We're going to talk about the Volvo XC90 Recharge. It's their plug-in hybrid vehicle. Got to spend a week in that. Ooh, I like that a lot. Uh, Lewis Pepper, uh, Perocapi. You do this every time. Perocapi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's from Lap Motorsports in Indianapolis. He's the mini race driver. And uh, every time we try to talk to him, we run out of time because we've got so much to chat about. Uh, Chris Winchek is going to be here from Alfa Romeo. We're going to talk about that brand new 4C. Uh, it's been a long time coming, but it's going to be exciting. Uh, I hope you think they're going to add power steering this time around. I don't know. Please add power steering in the 4C. <laughs> my arms my, are not strong enough. It's one of my favorites. I got to chat to the new head of public relations for Genesis. Uh, his name is Jared Pellat. And uh, he is a very cool guy. He's coming down from Canada. But their new GV80 is super interesting. And it's one of the first two vehicles that was specifically uh, developed for the Genesis brand. The, the couple, the three they had before this, were sort of developed initially as Hyundais. But these are total Genesis vehicles. And they are very, very cool. Uh, Jim Edwards is going to talk about that new hyperscreen. If you're watching the news in the last few weeks or so, the EQS, which is Mercedes, um, it's sort of the S series uh, electric car, the S class electric car that, that Mercedes Benz have. They're going to have an option of a screen that goes from side to side. Anton Wallman is going to join us to talk about what's happening with European car electric sales and Perry Stern here with the Mark E, which he's been test driving all week. We're going to find out if it lives up to all expectations. I had a bit of a preview and uh, he's uh, he's found a few things that he didn't expect with the marquee. We're going to find out all about that. So, um, you know, let's talk a little bit about this Volvo that I was driving. Uh, the XC90 <coughs> was kind of a bunch of fun. Volvo are heading into at least 50% of their vehicles are uh, going to be plug-in hybrid vehicles uh, uh, or at least electric, electrified powertrains over the next few years. The Volvo XC90 is one of those, the recharge. And it's interesting because I made a mistake in my television story when I talked about this. You I know. made a I mistake? Got, 
smacked over this one. Oh, my wow. hand slapped. I'm surprised. Uh, and I have to apologize uh, when we eventually get to talk to Russell. But I said that the XC90, or I said when Volvo separated from Ford, I think it was 2012. We used to jokingly call them Fjord. Uh, when, Vol- <laughs> when Volvo uh, separated from Ford, um, that uh, Ford left with their V6 engine and only left Volvo with a four-cylinder. Russell did correct me. Russell did say that uh, they were left with no engines. And uh, Volvo had to develop their own engines, and they decided just to head down the four-cylinder engine uh, oh. um, path. And so they basically had to reinvent themselves all of a sudden. And they did. They did a great job. But they only had a four-cylinder engine. And so now, inside this XC90, uh, which is their large three-row SUV, they have not only a uh, four-cylinder engine, but they have a supercharge, they have a turbocharge, and they have a hybrid powertrain. So joining us on the phone is Russell Datz. He is uh, the big cheese in the PR department. Uh, Russell, I will tell you, I've already made apologies for making a mistake in the broadcast uh, portion of my story saying that you were left with a four-cylinder engine. You clearly were not, and you had to redevelop it. <laughs> but I, uh, and knowing Russell Dats, I got my hand truly slapped for that one. So uh, No, no, no. A gentle correction, Nick. A gentle okay. correction. I like that technology. Uh, uh, as as the uh, the navigation uh, giant that Russell is, he steered the ship in the right direction, and uh, so it's true. You did have to reinvent the four cylinder engine, but you just didn't leave it there. You added turbocharged, supercharged, and hybrid, and you've ended up with you know a four hundred horsepower vehicle, which rivals many of the competition. Gives you more horsepower. It's true, um, you know, but it's not really about horsepower. It's about efficiency. And people like to hear horsepower, but the way things are going with sustainability and are being more cognizant of what we're doing to the environment and our our shift to electrification, uh, it really is about being efficient. So we do get a full package with this vehicle. We get efficiency, we get luxury, we get sustainability, and we do get performance. I mean, you can't hide it. I put my foot down in this vehicle, zero to 60 doesn't suck. <laughs> <laughs> It does, it does not. It goes pretty quickly, especially for a seven-passenger SUV. Uh, and it is, you know, it's smooth and quiet to drive. The uh, extended range really, it's electric when you want it and, uh, and efficient when you need it. No, and I think that's the good thing about it, too. Plus, you've, uh, you've given us all the things that we expected out of a Volvo. Great interior cabin, uh, definitely good, comfortable seats, a lot of uh, new technology, and you haven't disappointed in safety. In fact, there's much more of a safety story than a lot of people uh, want to credit Volvo with. Uh, apart from the safety inventions that you do, uh, including some of the old ones, for like the three-point seat belt and rear-facing in car seats and embedded booster seats, you've been working very hard with your safety uh, labs to do a lot of new passive and active safety systems, uh, especially the ones we don't see as well. Uh, it's true. I mean, the three-point safety belt is probably our most effective safety device. And once when we invented that in 1959, we immediately released the patent because we saw how beneficial it would be to society. And since then, it's saved more than a million lives. Now we're looking at the future and how do we save the next million, a million more? Can we save a million more lives? And we're doing it through, uh, you know, electronics uh, like uh, adaptive driver assistive system or autom- automatic driver assistive systems. Uh, our level two autonomy uh, helps people drive down the road safely. And, you know, we've got also some physical inventions recently in the car like a crumple zone for the front seats which not many people really understand or know about let's talk a little bit about the the sort of economic platform in this vehicle uh are people really searching out hybrids i know that, that in europe it's mandatory a lot of times it's a nice thing to not visit the gas station an awful lot but uh, americans are excited about hybrids as much as they are in europe uh, they are getting there. You know, it's, it's definitely a learning curve. Uh, people are used to their big V8 engines. Um, but I think if you uh, ask them if they enjoy going to the gas station once a week to put 50 gallons of gas in the Suburban, 
at uh, you know here in California, gas is three fifty a gallon. That's quite a chunk of money uh, to put in a car. So what if you could have something similar where you're at the gas station, you know, maybe once a month or not at all in the case yeah. of an all electric vehicle. And people don't travel well, much more. Travel they don't travel, travel, travel much more than 20 miles uh, on a single round trip. So you could probably get away with just plugging it in overnight and doing that. Uh, by the way, I know you had asked me this, but uh, my electric charger is on order. <laughs> so uh, feel free to send me more plug-in hybrids when you want to. <laughs> Uh, oh, we're happy to work with you, Nick, on that. We'll absolutely. And, you know, we have our new XC40 Recharge, which is our first all-electric vehicle. Yeah, uh, that, that's, that's what I was hinting that, at. That's what I was hinting at. Right? <laughs> okay, okay, I see. I was always in, there's always an alternative uh, MO, right? Right. Uh, in, Nick, yes. <laughs> in, the, in the last minute that we have left, uh, let's talk a little bit about availability and price of the uh, XC90 Recharge because uh, I think a lot of people are interested in getting something which is a step into the plug-in hybrid world. Yeah, so the XC90 T8, uh, is uh, it starts around uh, sixty five thousand. Uh, it is a beautiful vehicle. Uh, it is eligible for some incentives in uh, states uh, around the country. And the best thing about it is, yes, you can plug it in at home and charge it up overnight, uh, and never uh, never have to go to a gas station again, or at least significantly reduce your visits to gas stations. Because, as you mentioned. The average commute for people in, in normal times, of course, uh, is 26 minutes a day. Right. And the beauty about that car is you can do, with that, you can do most of your driving right. in all electric mode, recharge when you get home yeah. or uh, at the office. And it, it does plug into a regular 110 outlet, yeah. uh, and it'll just charge up like your phone overnight. If you are really uh, serious, you can get the level 2, 240 volt charge. Perfect. Absolutely. Russell, thank you. Uh, Volvo, of course, on sale right now. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show, our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all the past shows, see our automotive videos, and read inside the car stories about your next ride. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. Well, there's nothing like going fast. I enjoy it. Jen doesn't enjoy it. She likes to dry heave when I do it to her in the car. But uh, one man who definitely enjoys it is uh, Lewis Carpero Carpi. Did I get it right, Lewis? Did I say it right? Carpero Carpi. Yeah. Did. Woo, Jen. See, I told you I could get it right. Uh, he is in charge of the uh, Lap Motorsports team. Uh, they drive minis. That's one of the reasons that we're talking. I had a question for you, Lewis. What happens, because uh, you, you're based in the uh, Indianapolis uh, area, of course, the heart of many racing teams in America. Um, it snows a lot down there. It's cold. What do you guys do in the winter? Do you just sit in simulators, or do you sit in your living room going, wah, wah, with the Xbox? What do you do? Well, um, you know, we spend most of our time preparing the cars, you know, uh, they, they get beat up quite a bit through the racing season. Right. And, um, so we, we take them apart. We put, uh, all new components. Uh, we get the dampers, uh, checked and revalved. Uh, we change bearings and all these other gadgets or whatever that makes the cars go fast. So basically we spend the two or three months that we don't race and through the winter, uh, just getting ready for the next season. So those first few racing events of the spring or, or warm up laps or getting back on the track, are you a little rusty from the holiday season or from the, the cold? Uh, well, you know, uh, we stay sharp driving regardless, right? So the roads are pretty bad around here with snow. That that's always a lot of fun. And, uh, I have three minis in my driveway right. that, that, that we drive. So, you know, you can imagine how much fun it is to drive a mini in the snow. Yeah. You know, it's, it's fun to drive it on a, on a, on a road course, but you know, um, the mini's DNA was always, uh, part of rally. And so the, the winter roads here simulate that and it's, just a lot of fun. The back roads on my way to the shop every day. <laughs> uh, how many tickets have you got? Zero in my oh, life. Really? In your life? 
Really? Yes, no, no that, tickets ever. That not even a park. Ticket. That <laughs> somehow park. does not seem fair. I mean, I do you just do you know a guy, or you're just super careful? Uh, you know, I I don't know. I mean, I'm not that re- re- reckless driving in the street. You know, I get I get most of my, you know, the the anxiousness of driving and doing crazy stuff uh, on on the tr- on the track under a controlled environment. So at home, you know, it's the the crazy stuff that I may do here or there. If the if the roads are snowy, you know, just drift around a corner here or there. But right. also, you know, so. So I'm not doing crazy stuff. I don't speed. I don't. I don't. I, I. I. I obey the law. I do a good job at doing that. I stop. I do complete stops at stop signs, and I, I use my turn signals and all right. that kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah, and the, yeah. the biggest the biggest problem for me is is it's interesting you say that because I tend to obey all speed limits um, because I do get it out on the track quite often when I get to go on to motor motor events. I get to yeah. to do some track driving and that sort of thing. It's not to say that I haven't put my foot down occasionally in uh, in straight roads and just to see how cars perform, but ultimately uh, I I tend to abide ninety nine point nine percent of uh, speed limits, etc. Uh, unless traffic is you know moving slightly faster, and then I'll go with the flow. But ultimately, uh, I would have thought that most of us who drive for a living value our driver's licenses a little more. So. We, we do, you yeah. know, and, and I do the same thing. I mean, I'm the highway. Everybody goes five, 10 miles and I'll go with the flow, you know, never really do anything crazy. Like I said, I, I, I get to do all this stuff on the track under a controlled environment legally, you know, so, so um, my daily, my daily drives are pretty, pretty, pretty boring unless there's snow on the road, you know? Right. Now, you you seem to have your fair share of uh, of wins or podium, uh, at least podium finishes uh, in the last several years. Um, tell us about some of your wins or podium finishes that you've had. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I've been fortunate enough to be very successful. We're very passionate about it. So uh, I have a great team behind me, engineers, my my partner in the team is our technical director, so he knows how to make cars go fast. And but yeah, we've been very successful. Um, one of my uh, so I've ra- I've won. There's two races that I've won that have been very special to me. And one is not in the mini. It was in an off road truck at the Baja 1000 in 2014. Wow! And that was pretty pretty fun and impressive we we won by 10 hours over second place and uh it was the longest baja 1000 in the history of the 1000 so i think it was about 1400 miles we did it in about 23 hours right and uh zero punctures which was crazy and and yeah we just killed it we just killed it and it was amazing and And that was and the mini win tell us about the mini win so the mini win, I took one of my the minis up to Canada at Three Rivers, and it was the 50th anniversary, and it was a street course uh, layout, which and and it was late in the afternoon, it was raining, so it was in the dark between the walls, and I just killed wow. it too, like I mean just it, on the wet. So the mini is just so good, you know, handles so good, much better than most of the cars. So it wasn't that difficult, but but just being very precise with keeping the car off the wall and there's still a lot of slippage going on so and at high speed so it was a it was a very very uh, satisfying win oh i like it when you win uh final question before we have to go are you excited yeah. about the new minis coming yeah the gp3 i mean uh you know, i saw you did a segment on social media on one yeah. of them uh, so our new car, we're building a new mini, right? Uh, based off the GP3, and we think it's going to be a beast. I mean, the JCW has been amazing for us yeah. for the last six years. This GP3 is going to be incredible. If you yeah. want to keep up with uh, Lewis and the whole team, I will recommend 
Go spend some time at the website, and I'll give it to you. Make sure you just make a mental note of it. It's very easy to remember. It's LAP, L-A-P, Motorsports, L-L-C, Motorsports with an S, LLC.com. Go check it out and uh, keep abreast of it. Uh, We will keep abreast of all the wins that you have and all the events that you take uh, part in because we love following you, Lewis. Good luck. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Well, uh, this is our Auto Expert Radio Show. It's on Facebook, on Twitter, on Instagram, and you can start a conversation with us, ask us a car question, just direct messages at our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. Interesting enough, we uh, have a brand new Alfa Romeo 4C Spider 33 Stardale. Uh, It's the Tributo. Is that my Italian? Am I doing it right? Tributo? I don't know what you're asking. Tribute. You, you keep telling me you're Italian. Yeah, I don't speak it. Well, how can you be Italian if you don't speak it? You're Italian. Do you speak it? Tribut. No, 2,000 years ago, I'm Italian. So? Tributo. <laughs> uh, we can just pretend. It's a homage to the legend. It's uh, handcrafted in Moderna, Italy. The 4C Spider 30, 33 Stardale Tributo honors the 1967 Alfa Romeo 33 Stardale. It's uh, really the brand's legendary mid-engine sports car. I love the 4C. And I'm glad to see that this has a new iteration, a new life. If you've never seen it, it's this very small, uh, very small sports car. And it has the very similar uh, monocoque uh, guest design on the inside where it's a single aluminum piece. Um, And you'll find that in some vehicles where around a million dollars. Very, very lightweight and great for doing high speeds with very small engines, like a four-cylinder engine. Four C, four-cylinder. Do you know, know. Do you know that? You get it? Okay, just checking. I just remember horsey, four C. Horsey, four C. <laughs> One of my five. <laughs> Inspired by the original limited four C edition, it features exclusive Rosso Villa. De esta tri-coated paint, gray and gold five-hold alloy wheels, and black and tobacco interior. As mm. long as it looks tobacco and doesn't smell tobacco, I think we're probably fine. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the tobacco interior. It smells like old smoke. Uh, it has the first, uh, it, it's in the first 4C Spider, the uh, 32 Stradale Trabuto. Trabuto? I think you're just... Tributo. I think you should just like put it in English. In English, English? Traboto. <laughs> <laughs> it has a red finish carbon fiber, uh, the monocoque, uh, of course, the uh, the single aluminum one piece body. Um, and is designed under the direction of Centro Stifili, Alfa Romeo. The 4C Spider 33 Stardale Tributo comes with a commemorative badging and a plaque and a book. You get a book free with your car. Mm, that's exciting. No, not for me. It is uh, for me. It's also available <laughs> at uh, dealers uh, around the country. Uh, starting price, just a mere $80,000, $79,995 for the US MSRP, excluding destination. So it's going to cost you a little bit more. I love the color, the mm-hmm. nice dark red. The only thing that has ever bothered me, and they say this, they they say this because it makes the car lighter. They don't have power steering. I in know. It. I've driven it too. It's, well, not this one, but the older one. Yeah, it's it makes it hurts my arms. I love this car. How did people drive vehicles without power steering? The only problem I had is backing it up without, without power, power steering. steering. But once you get driving, it's, it's fine good. when you're on the freeway. But when you have to maneuver it around a parking lot, it's like, yes, my Loma, my driving Loma doesn't have power steering. It's and if I have to turn it in a very small area around the lawn, oh, it hurts. It's my your arm. workout. You gotta think of it as your workout. Yeah, I yeah. have very big biceps, but not very big <laughs> triceps. I do. I have abnormally big biceps, but my triceps are not big. I know. I know. Just shut up. I know. I have to go to the gym, but. <laughs> But power steering is a, if you ever driven, I'm sure there's people amongst our audience nationwide, several of you, and it must be out of the two million that we have, that have driven vehicles without power steering. But it's a wake up call. Like if you drive a vehicle, it's an older truck or something without power steering, it's hard work. It or if is. your power steering <laughs> goes out, it's hard work. <laughs> like, you, please social messages, social media messages, if you've driven a vehicle without power steering, 
it's uncomfortable. Well, yeah, because we're used to being spoiled. Especially since we're older now, we get short of breath when we have to do that. <laughs> it's very tough. So do you talk about like the six-speed alpha twin clutch transmission? No. 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 Let's get into that. Yeah. Okay. What about it? What about it? It's fast. <laughs> <laughs> twin clutches are always better for changing gear. Um, you know, Tim Kaniskas, my pal, who's the head of uh, global head of Alfa Romeo. Um, this is done under his watch. And if you know anything about Tim, mm-hmm. Tim's a special guy. He probably won't mind me saying this. Mm -mm. But Tim's the guy who's responsible for all the Dodge powerful engines. He's responsible for the Hellcat. He's actually responsible for the Jeeps that are out there, too, with all the big engines. He's one of my idols. (laughs) He was was at Jeep for a a year, and he brought all these big, powerful engines into Jeep. Then he went back to Dodge, um, and he did all these. So Tim is a sneaky little man. Mm -hmm. and Well, he's not that little. He's a sneaky, buff, muscly man who uh, (laughs) likes... I think, and I'm going to guess at his history because I I can't remember it perfectly, but he used to be a car salesman in Chicago. And uh, he loves drag and muscle cars. Loves them. And uh, he loves to drag race himself. Good. And so anything that he brings out tends to have a lot. I mean, you know Tim approved something when it has a lot of horsepower. When it has the word demon next (laughs) to it. (laughs) Hellcat, you know, like Hellcat, demon, red Red eye. That's all Jim. No, that's all Tim. That's all Tim. Tim, Tim did all of that stuff. So uh, you know that he uh, he approved this because he likes uh, fast, light, fun cars. Uh, this vehicle is, it looks very nice with its tri-coat color. <laughs> it's interesting, the wheels, uh, they call it five-hole alloy wheels. It's the um, traditional. We, we call it spokes, usually. We well, don't say holes. But they're holes. One, well, but, yeah, but you, you, I would call it one, two, three, four, There's five, five holes. six. There's six five. Six spokes. Five holes, six spokes. Yeah. But you call them holes or spokes. In America, well, I call those it, spokes. Right, we call them spokes. But, but the, I would never say holes. But those aren't really spokes. They're Spokes come straight or more straight. These are seriously holes. Uh, <laughs> they kind of are holes, but most people would call them five, uh, six spokes wheels. Americans would. Americans right. never would have looked at those wheels and called them five hole wheels. They call them six spoked <laughs> wheels, wouldn't very, they? Very true. I've never heard anybody ever in any press release I've ever read call them hold wheels. Well, this is Italian. We aren't normal. <laughs> no, they aren't normal. We're normal. They aren't normal. Are you calling yourself not normal or normal? I'm not normal. Well, I know that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you are weird. Um, so it looks beautiful. Uh, there's no price on it, though. MSRP of, oh, wait. Yes, it is. There is a price? Yeah. What's the price? 79 Oh, yeah. We talked about yeah. it. And yeah. And it's yeah. really cool. I'm not buying one. <laughs> because they... it starts at 79000 blah, 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 80 whatever and then with delivery. And yeah. then, you and know, then, you know you me. I have to I, work out. You know me. I have to check all the boxes. Right. Well, I'll be paying a hundred thousand dollars for this by the time it arrives. I know, but I'll keep my keep my BMW X6M. Thank you very much. So, which do you my like? Bronco. Be- which do you like my better, Lexus. the nineteen sixty seven or the two thousand? Oh, wait, let me look at the sixty seven. You got to look at them next to each Where other. Where's the sixty seven? Why am I seeing it? View you gotta, all images. Got to click photo. <laughs> Where's which is the sixty seven? The oh, very yeah. bottom. That's Ooh, what it pays kinda, homage to. I kind of like the sixty seven. I know, isn't it? It's got the weird headlights that go almost down to the road in the 1967 mm-hmm. Alfa Romeo 33 Stradale. Isn't it interesting, the similarities? Yeah, sort of. It's a lot longer, the 1967 version. Mm-hmm. They, You know, these designers, they say that they pay homage to and they look like. I don't know, always know if they do. It looks a lot taller and shorter than the new one. It the is. old one was, I don't know, more James Bondy. It all, you know what the old, old one looks like? It looks like uh, they reused aircraft windows in the side. Do you remember the pilots? Yes. Like you're in a plane and they slide that window back and they lean out to the guy that's... Re- I just leaned away from the microphone, sorry. They lean out <laughs> to the guy that was, that's refueling. They go, hey, blah, 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 out the window. It looks like one of those windows that a pilot would slide down. With, with the aluminum <laughs> trim around the outside, doesn't it? Yes. In the old 1967. The lights are beautiful. You should Google this, guys, if you want to see a picture of it. Yeah, 1967 Alfa Romeo 33... Stradale um, versus the new uh, Alfa Romeo 4C, the 33 Stradale. Spider. Spider, which means is Italian for convertible. Convertible. Is it Italian? Yeah. 
except the Germans like to spell it with S-P-Y-D-E-R, which is incorrect, by the way. It's S-P-I-D-E-R. They just do that to be clever. <laughs> saying. It's my English kicking in. It annoys me. Uh, it's it very all beautiful. can't be as perfect as you, Nick. Uh, nobody can be as perfect nope. as me. I keep telling that to my spouse all the time. It's really hard to be a genius. You, know, you, you have no idea what it's like to live with my um, with being a genius. It does look very nice. Uh, it is a two seater, <laughs> which is another reason not to have kids, or at least um, <laughs> not to give rides to people. I am very I'm a strong believer in two seaters because you don't have to. My sister is too. She purposely buys vehicles that are two seaters so she doesn't have to give people rides. It's just her and the dog, right? <laughs> she has freckles. She has in two. The front. No, she has two freckles. She has freckle and buddy. Mm -hmm. And she went and bought a Land Rover Discovery. In England, they have a two door version, which is a truck. And not a truck, but a, an SUV with a two door. Right. And the back is all like a van version. Mm -hmm. So it has no windows right. all the way back. It's like a commercial vehicle. And it has no seats in the back. So it's only two oh. seats up front. And she bought this purposely <laughs> so she doesn't have to give anyone rides. And there's two dog crates in the back. She's like, That's perfect. See ya. Bye. Good not getting every one of my friends or her kids. She said, the boys have cars. Good luck. See ya. Bye. <laughs> They're both big enough to drive themselves. Mum doesn't have to give you rides anymore. I think it's awesome. All right. If you want to look at it, check out the Alfa Romeo website, the 4C Spider 33 Stradale Trobuto. It's a beautiful color, and it has spokes, not holes in the wheels, which are an interesting gold color. Uh, you can pick one up if you have $80,000 plus and change and jiggling in your puppy. And yes, and no, no uh, power steering. Because that will drive it. There's actually some very nice video of it as well on the website. You go watch that as well. It's a beautiful vehicle, and it's uh, it's hitting dealers uh, probably later this year. Mm -hmm. uh, you could probably get a test drive too. Uh, every city, every major city in the US has a upper man. All right, more to come. We have got a whole lot of a packed show. Stand by. Our auto expert. More on the way. You're listening to our auto expert. This is our auto expert radio show. Our auto expert, of course, has a podcast you can listen to. Tens of thousands of people have downloaded our auto expert podcast and many more stream our auto expert podcast. Join the happy listeners via iHeartRadio. You can also do it on Spotify, Pandora app. You can do it on Deezer, Podbean, CastBox and OurAutoExpert.com. Hours of endless fun always await you. I'm Nick Miles and this is our auto expert radio show. Two million Americans enjoy our auto expert and get the news every day from our auto expert. Uh, Jen. Yes. Do you know that uh, there is something called the beast? Yes, I do. Uh, the beast is what they call the presidential limo. Mm -hmm. um, do you, have you read my facts about it? No, but All we right. talked about it before. Uh, the beast, of course, uh, President Obama was the last person to change the beast. It used to be a Lincoln, mm -hmm. but now... It is a Cadillac. Yes. But it isn't. Well, it just has the badging. It has the badging. <laughs> but underneath, it actually is uh, more of a commercial vehicle. It has a Duramax diesel engine. Uh, it has a lot of very interesting things. But did you know that uh, once you become president of the United States, you can no longer drive on public roads for the rest of your yes. natural life? Oh, afterwards, too? Mm, you can no longer drive on public roads for the rest of the I will never life. become president. I like to drive No, too I much. can pretty much guarantee that. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> um, yeah, so once you become president of the United States, you can no longer drive on public roads for the rest of your life. It's very interesting. Uh, it's an administrative rule. Mm. And I learned about this because of an interview that President Bush gave. Uh, and the interview really talked about why. And one of the reasons is because it's a public safety uh, problem. They don't want you driving purely because uh, members of the public may see you driving a vehicle and decide to sideswipe you um, or drive into you because they were unhappy with your current you know, policies or previous policies you may have had when you were president. And you become a danger not just to – they become a danger to you, but not just that. They could be a danger to other people on the road. Okay, so you said – 
public roads. Yes. So they could go to the racetrack still. Then. They could. And also George uh, George Bush, the, the only living Bush president, mm-hmm. uh, he is able to drive on his ranch in Texas. And he drives, interestingly enough, a King Ranch Ford F-150. That doesn't surprise me. No, of course it doesn't. He drives <laughs> that around his ranch in Texas, but he's not allowed to drive it on the road. If he wants to leave the ranch, he has to have a Secret Service agent drive him. Hmm. Um, and uh, he usually drives in some kind of car. Perfect. It's a very so, difficult life once you've been a president. So I would. Become, it's a difficult life. Become president and then build my own racetrack. So yeah, I, I mean, it's probably much better for you not to become president and then build your own racetrack. Why? It seems like the road to you, you know being president and then and then not being president. That road is. Well, you may have wanted to start a, polit- a political career long ago. Long if ago. If you were thinking of yes, having a political career. Yes, I know. Career. I'm not that old. So let's talk more about this uh, presidential limo. Uh, it, the interesting that you can no longer drive. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's also some other interesting things about this. Of course, uh, what happens to those old limos once they're retired? They retire them quite regularly because they do about, uh, about four to eight miles a gallon of diesel. They're, they're so heavy that uh, they do that. Uh, they used to all get retired to museums, but the current ones have so much technology and uh, so many things in them that now they blow them up. They are exploded at air bases in training exercises, et cetera, et cetera. So they, they get blown up on testing fields. Would that be um, fun to watch or what? I'm sure it is. That would be interesting. Uh, who drives the presidential limo? Well, every Secret Service member has 500 hours of driving training, but the guys that actually drive them are specially trained with even more training than that, driving the presidential limos. They do special driving courses. Remember, this has the wheels of a school bus, which have Kevlar in them to protect them from bullets and explosions. Uh, so these things are super, super heavy. They have a lot of equipment on board, including rocket launchers, uh, machine guns, lots of firearms are on board. Uh, they also have oxygen tanks. Uh, they have uh, two pints of the president's um, blood on board, just in case that he should need them in case of an emergency or an accident. Mm. Um, and it's not his actual blood. I believe it's his blood type of blood on board. Okay. Um, They have a lot of communications equipment, which is, um, of course, um, encrypted so he can have his own conference calls so the security services can uh, communicate with other people. But it's not the only vehicle in the presidential uh, lineup. They have lots of other vehicles as well as the Beast or the presidential limo. In the fleet are SUVs. We've seen those. Uh, You see them driving in the motorcade as well as motorcycles. There are a thousand pounds each, the presidential Secret Service motorcycles that drive in the motorcade. And these are not the local police. The local police also uh, take up part of the motorcade. There is uh, quad bikes that they use. Uh, and there's also push bikes that the Secret Service use. So they have quite a fleet of vehicles that get used as well. Um, there are a lot of other things that go on in that uh, presidential motorcade. Uh, some of the standard trim pieces like uh, headlamps and tail lamps and uh, the overall grill, they are actually Cadillac. But the rest of the vehicle, it's nothing. It's not any part of a Cadillac. The engine is, is uh, I think I told you, a Duramax diesel engine. It's a GM rugged heavy-duty commercial vehicle underneath all of that uh, trimmings and, and overpin. Um, and it's completely different from uh, Cadillac. The, the Beast has its very own aeroplane. It's a Secret Service special C-17 Globemaster transport aircraft. It's to haul the Beast to any different country. And there are maybe several beasts out there. We know of at least two. There are maybe numerous beasts uh, around the world that get flown everywhere. And of course, all the other vehicles like the Chevy Suburbans that they use are also heavily armored. Um, The Chevy Suburbans are nicknamed the Roadrunner. And they are rolling communications uh, vehicles. And they have satellites in them as well. Uh, and they call it SATCOM devices, so they can uh, they can satellite communicate from the the roof satellites on the roof of them, so they can communicate with airplanes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So uh, there is a, a lot of great equipment. <laughs> there is a satellite communication station. Um, there is uh, that they use, which is in Dallas, I believe. Um, there is also uh, they don't have any convertibles after John F. Kennedy got assassinated. They uh, no longer have convertible uh, presidential limos because it's uh, considered dangerous for the president. 
So, what president drove the first electric car? Oh, I have no idea. I do know that the first the first presidential limo was 1925, I think. No, 1902. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Theodore um, Roosevelt. Yeah, and there was 25,000 in the pre- presidential limo uh, um, budget in 1902. How, uh, who drove the first electric? Um, let's see, William Taft. Uh, he drove a Baker electric. Oh. And then Theodore... Lincoln have had the... the and Theodore Roosevelt um, also had one, too. Uh, they, 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 Lincoln had the contract for a long time. Now it has gone to a Cadillac. I think that Jeep is going to get it with the Grand Wagoneer. You think so? Yeah. That'd be interesting. Wouldn't it be great to have an SUV as a presidential vehicle? Mm, I don't know. No? I don't know. I uh, guess it would be better than a limo. I think limos are old school. And there was a so 1984. Let's move forward, everybody. All right, more Our Auto Expert on the way. Uh, presidential limos, that's all you need to know. Stand by, more to come. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. Locally created, nationally celebrated from the northwest to the southeast, this is the World's Car Radio Show. If it has a throttle, we'll feature it on air, online, on smartphone, or on smart speaker. This is Our Auto Expert, where two million Americans get their automotive news daily. I'm your host, Nick Miles, along with truck girl Jen. Had an opportunity to drive the new uh, Genesis GV80. Uh, This is their first SUV for the company, but it will not be their last. There is at least uh, one more that we know about, possibly mm, two more that we know about, but we're going to get the inside scoop. Joining us on the phone is Jared Appellett. He is the gentleman in charge of the public relations department for uh, Genesis. So we had a chance to catch up a little bit this week offline, uh, Jared. It sounds like uh, we probably need at least two hours to chat on the radio to cover all the bases that uh, Genesis has going on. But let's start with the very basics. Uh, Genesis is, for those people that don't already know, the luxury arm of the Hyundai Motor Group. And it has done already what I would consider turning the luxury industry upside down far faster than we expected it to happen. I would put my mark on around five years of catching up with companies like Lexus. But I think you're very fast, uh, nipping at the heels of Lexus very fast. And the new G, uh, G80 and GV80 are pretty much astounding. Those vehicles both... Uh, high-end luxury vehicles, and and you've probably got uh, journalists' mouths uh, salivating for what's to come next. Well, first of all, Nick, thank you so much for having me, and uh, it's great to chat with you once again. Uh, it's a really exciting time at Genesis. It, it starts, like you said, with product. We have some fantastic products from uh, G70, which is our sports sedan, an incredibly dynamic and exciting, fun-to-drive car, which, you know, happened to be recognized for North American Car of the Year in 2019, all the way up to uh, our newest products, like the GV80 SUV, our first-ever SUV, which is this great, balanced, refined ride with all sorts of great comfort features and versatility. So uh, on the product side, very exciting time at Genesis, but, but product is not the whole story. It's also the experience that we provide. Um, If you purchase a Genesis vehicle, we come to you for whatever you need. So the vast majority of our retailers in the United States are providing Genesis concierge service with sales valet. So you can do a test drive right at your residence or place of business. And if you purchase a Genesis vehicle, we have service valet. So we're the only manufacturer in the country that will come to your residence and pick up your car for an oil change and leave you a courtesy car behind. So um, really exciting products and services right now at Genesis. It's it's refreshing because in a time where people are having to reinvent themselves and try and work out what isn't working, 
you're sort of breaking new ground in a sense. You're deciding what to do differently, not what to change. And that, to me, is a breath of fresh air. It's uh, let's invent, not reinvent, which I think is definitely minty fresh in the industry, uh, as opposed to those people are going, where did we go wrong? Rather, in a sense, too, you are going, where do we need to do, you know, where do we need to, to start going right uh, where others have gone wrong, which is always great. But you also, when Genesis sort of form, formulated this plan, you didn't try and uh, educate people in a way you wanted them to do things. You brought in people with experience, and you did that with a team of people who already knew how to do many of these jobs uh, in the form of your designers and your engineers. Right. Well, we have a a world-class team uh, at Genesis. And like you said, it starts with the product, right? So on the design side, our head of design is Sang-Yup Lee, uh, a Korean designer who uh, has designed some wonderful cars over the years, some American muscle cars, and who has worked on some luxury vehicles and brands in Europe. Uh, We also have Albert Bierman, who is the head of research and development for Hyundai Motor Group, who works on Genesis. And, you know, he famously uh, led uh, the performance division at BMW for many years. And and he brings a lot of know-how in terms of designing products and engineering products that are uh, not just good looking, uh, but exceptionally fun to drive. So and and there's so many more uh, all stars on this team. I could talk to you about it for hours. In the inside of the vehicle, getting in, it's really not like anything I've sat in before. It's it's refreshing. The steering wheel doesn't look like it came from anything else. The the screen doesn't look like it came from anything else. The seats, the interior, it, it's a whole design language which is developed around new ideas. Absolutely. So on, on the exterior, we like to call our new design language athletic elegance. Um, it's, it's this exceptionally um, bold-looking design with great, profo- uh, great proportion, so this swept-back roof line, uh, a very extended, long wheelbase with short overhangs, and it gives uh, the vehicle a sense of motion even when it's standing still. And what we've done at Genesis is our designers wanted to give Genesis uh, a distinct identity so that when you see a Genesis on the road, you'll know, even without looking at the badge, hey, that's a Genesis. And so we have this striking new uh, two lines look. With It starts with the, the headlamps at the front, goes all the way through the side of the vehicle and through the taillights at the back. And when you see two lines, you'll know that it's a Genesis vehicle. And that's on the outside. When you open the door and step into the cabin, you'll notice that it's incredibly elegant and simple. We like to call this the beauty of white space, and it's inspired by traditional uh, Korean architecture in our homeland. Uh, So very simple, a really great ergonomic layout, uh, one slim air vent that goes horizontally across the front of the cabin, and all of the controls that you need right where you can reach them in the middle. So, uh, And, of course, we use exceptional materials, uh, Napa leather, open pour natural wood, real aluminum, et cetera. So uh, it's, a, it's a really great experience inside the cabin. I think that simplicity is then what you talked about is in the, in the purchase and the ownership, right? It's as simple as you can make it. If we don't have to do anything as an owner, if you can make our lives as simple as possible as an owner, you're doing that, right? Absolutely. You know, People like to use the word luxury and talk about, you know, fancy features and technologies. But for us, um, time is luxury. Uh, people are busy. They, they have very busy lives and, and lots of things to do. And the ultimate luxury is us respecting your time. Uh, if you own a vehicle, chances are you have to have an oil change. So it only makes sense for us to, to come to you to make sure that we service your vehicle um, in a way that is not disruptive to your daily life. And so that's the kind of experience that we want to provide at Genesis. I think the other thing is uh, a luxury for me is getting given something for, you know, we can all get things if we pay for them. 
But in a sense, too, one of the luxuries of life is getting given things and not having to pay exorbitant prices, right? We can all sail around the world in a world-class yacht and have champagne and caviar delivered to us if we pay for it. But you are offering us many of the things that we could get elsewhere, but we'd have to pay a huge price for them. And this is coming in the price which is a lot less than we would have to pay uh, elsewhere. And that's one of the things that's highly attractive about Genesis is we're not paying a fortune for things that we think. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a big fan of luxury, but I think everybody in the world should be able to have luxury at an acceptable price. Uh, I totally agree with you, Nick. I mean, and that's why we include all of these services within the price of the car. There is no extra fee added on for this at-home service. When you purchase a Genesis vehicle, or lease a Genesis vehicle for that matter, um, it's included for three years or 60,000 miles. So, um, you know, the the at-home service that I'm talking about, the complimentary scheduled maintenance, uh, even things like Genesis Connected Services, which is our uh, telematics system where you can download a mobile app on your phone and remote start your vehicle and check its status, see if the doors are locked, etc. Um, all of that is included in the price of the vehicle for the first three years. So it really makes the ownership experience quite simple. So what's to come? What have you got? What's on the books for the future? So 2021 is a very exciting year for Genesis. And it starts in the next few months, in the first half of the year, with a redesigned G70. So we already have this exciting, um, critically acclaimed sports sedan. Well, the same G70 that everyone knows and loves is going to get redesigned, an all-new look, with some extra performance features like variable exhaust, like a Sport Plus driving mode. It's going to be a lot of fun. I can't wait. And that's coming uh, very, very soon. Okay. And if that were not enough, we have what I'd like to say is definitely a killer product, GB70, our second SUV. Uh, this SUV is smaller than GB80. It's sporty. It's dynamic. It's going to have a great low center of gravity and be fun to drive. Uh, and that's going to be coming sometime later this year. I won't give away the specifics just yet. And again, if that were not enough, before the end of the year, we will be revealing our first electric vehicle. So uh, lots of great product news coming from Genesis. I would push you more, but I've, I've already been told that you can't tell me more. So <laughs> I've already asked those questions. I'm excited and uh, I can't wait. I think you have some killer products. There's now uh, three products in the lineup. There are three sedans and an SUV with a new sedan coming, a new G, uh, G70 coming and a new uh, GV70 coming. I look forward to the six, I hope, in the, in the future. Uh, Jared, thank you for spending part of your week Canada. More Our Auto Expert on the way. Stand by. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. Catch up with previous episodes of the show at our website, ourautoexpert.com. You can hear all past shows, see automotive videos, and read insider car stories about your next ride. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. You'll find it all at ourautoexpert.com. There, you will see a video about the largest screen ever to hit the dash. Of, it actually becomes the dash. Very exciting. Um, oh, yeah. Why don't you turn your mic on there, Jen? Isn't it exciting? <laughs> yeah. Let's try that again. <laughs> it would hit the dash of uh, any single car ever, and it is the hyperscreen in the new Mercedes-Benz. Uh, it's going to be in the EQS, and uh, to tell us all about that is uh, Jim Edwards joining us on the phone. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us to talk about the new hyperscreen. First of all, uh, this is going to be part of the EQS as an option, but it's, uh, it's part of the MBUX system, which is Mercedes-Benz Intelligent, uh, what do you call it, Intelligent AI, Interactive, Emotional, Separate Brain, Clever Clogs? Is that the right word? Am I explaining it correctly? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds perfect, actually. <laughs> first, thanks for, thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm pretty excited because this is actually my first radio interview I've ever done. So oh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to not make you cry. We, that's always the promise <laughs> the first time. As long as we make you laugh, it's a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> perfect, right? <laughs> uh, 
So tell yeah, us, so, tell us, um, yeah, tell us about the MBUX Hyperscreen. Yeah, of course. So as you mentioned, it is the largest display we've ever placed in a Mercedes Benz. Um, it's a beautiful and really intelligent display coming on our all electric EQS sedan. Um, you mentioned it, it's 56 inches wide. It's got that gently curved glass panel. And for the first time, the passenger will also have their very own display. So really impressive work of art from our interior design tech, uh, group and really amazing technology from our UI department. There's nothing that annoys me more than my passenger leaning over and touching things on my screen. I don't know about you, but that annoys <laughs> I me. I can definitely understand that. <laughs> yeah, it's like, hey, I'm driving. I should, I'm in control. I mean, you should be able to, the passengers should be able to do their heated seats and their, and their own temperature and stuff. But uh, as a driver, it annoys me. But I think the other thing is uh, I do like some of the options that are available now where the passenger can actually input a destination from their side. That does help. Because obviously, as a driver, it's hard to input a destination via GPS when you're driving, or you know, via the via the sat navigation system, because that's hard yeah. when you're driving. And with an English yeah. accent, even even MBUX has a hard time understanding me a lot of times. It's funny. <laughs> even people in the car have a hard time understanding me. Exactly. Often. And radio <laughs> listeners. And interviewees, they sometimes have a hard time understanding me too. Uh, so there, there are a few interesting things about this. Uh, you, so uh, I'm, I'm, I'm having a hard time even uh, understanding this myself. A lot of this screen is, almost looks like it is not lit up when it's not being used, but it really is. The pixels just go black. Is that right when they're not being used? Yeah, that's right. So. The central display is 17.7 uh, .7 inches wide, so it's pretty massive, and it uh, uses OLED technology. So something like our phones and, and high-end TVs, um, it really shows those true blacks by turning off the pixels. Uh, so you have a really impressive um, true blacks, and then also because of that technology, the screens kind of seamlessly fade away so it really looks like hyperscreen is one single screen, and that's part of the beauty of it. And then when you need pieces of stuff, it just lights up again, right? Absolutely, yes. And, and, then, and then the other thing I didn't really understand is it, it, you're not going to have lots of sub-menus. Everything is going to be pretty much there and available. So you're not going to have to bury nine different menus deep to find what you need. Everything's sort of going to be only one click away. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. So one of the biggest distractions is really having to scroll through endless lists or dive into sub-menus, which is where the zero layer comes into play. And with artificial intelligence, MBUX knows exactly what you need and pops it up to the forefront. So imagine that you um, always call your significant other on the way home from work, and it's cold outside, so you probably want your heated steering wheel on. Well, the car remembers that you know it's five o'clock. You're driving home from your office. You know, back when we used to all go into the office, and it will pop up with an intelligent suggestion on the top to say, "Hey." Um, why don't you call your, your friend or significant other? Um, by the way, it's cold outside. Would you like your heated seat on? Um, so so, so let, let's, see, let's see how well Jen knows me. On the navigation map, Jen, what would it show? Uh, BBC. No, no. On the navigation screen, on the map, what would it show? What would, what would like Starbucks. Up? Yeah, there you go. See, see how well she knows me? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Every Starbucks on the map would light up. Well, I thought you were yeah, talking about the Hey Mercedes. And, and, and every so often, I'm, the car would go, would you like to stop at this Starbucks? What about the next one? What about the next one? That's what it keeps saying to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> would you like an espresso now? Right. Yeah. So here's the big question is, uh, and this is the final one because we're running out of time. Uh, we're, we're, I, I know this is only in the EQS. Will it be anything more than the EQS? Um, so on the technology side, we we have to be at the forefront of things as that's what Mercedes customers expect. And we'll investigate and, and make new display concepts possible where it makes sense from a business case and then where also our customers want it. But the first time a customer will see it will be on our all-electric EQS coming in the fall. And that's uh, it's going to cost you just under $100,000, right? Um, well, I can't speak 
kick off quite yet, but um, I would stay tuned for uh, more information in, in a few months when we can show you guys more about the car. All right, just so you know, in future, Jim, this is the tricky part of the interview when I try to trick you into yeah. telling me the price. That's why I always so laugh. Just, he <laughs> always pushes. <laughs> just to let you know, every journalist will do the same thing to you. This is where you got to be clever, and this is where your PR uh, educators a, will tell you. He did a great be ca- job. Be careful. He'll sneak in something at the end, yep. and he'll try to trick you into answering. <laughs> Jim, five stars for your first interview. You did really, really well. Congratulations. Hey, thank you. Thanks for teaching us all about the uh, the brand new hyperscreen and the, uh, the EQS as part of the uh, MBUX system. We're really looking forward, and I, I look forward to actually getting to test drive the vehicle and trying the new screen out. It looks really great. I'm excited. Finally, somebody gets a screen that goes from A-pillar to A-pillar. Jim Edwards is a product manager for uh, Mercedes-Benz, and I look forward to seeing that in the new vehicle. Anton Wallman is next. We'll check out how European vehicle sales have been and what's going on in the world of electric cars. Stand by. You're listening to the Our Auto Expert Podcast. This is Our Auto Expert Show. Our Auto Experts on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can start a conversation with us, ask a car question, just direct messages at Our Auto Expert. Our Auto Expert is where 2 million Americans get their automotive news daily. He joins us weekly. His name is Anton Wallman. He is an independent analyst and investor. You can read the majority of his stuff at the street and Seeking Alpha. Uh, Anton, there is an awful lot going on in the car industry as we uh, ramp up everything that begins in 2021. Uh, let's talk about what happened at the end of last year. Uh, Tesla sales 2020 in Europe. Uh, the numbers are in. Finally, we can look at uh, how things are. So give us a synopsis of how things are in 2020 for Tesla sales in Europe compared to 2019. Yeah, so Nick, we uh, divide the world into three major geographies, sort of North America, mainly U.S. and Canada, and then Asia, which is dominated these days by China, and then Europe. And as it turns out that the competitive forces in terms of the requirements on the major automakers to sell a certain percentage of their vehicles that are of a certain uh, fuel standard uh, dictate that they really increase their electric car sales. And what that led to in 2020 is that the competition for electric vehicles went straight through the roof. And of course, the victim of that was the early leader in uh, in that business, which was Tesla. Tesla sales were actually down 10% in 2020 over 2019 in terms of the total number of units of vehicles that they sold in the European theater. And that was while the overall electric car car market in Europe was up, uh, at least for the first 11 months, it was up 123%. So the market more than doubled and Tesla's sales fell by 10%. So Tesla clearly lost almost about 60% market share in Europe in um, 2020. Now, December, they usually do pretty well, and the final numbers aren't tallied for December yet. Do you think they'll regain some of that? Uh, Not really, because they had a really strong December in 2019. They sold the most amount of cars that Tesla's ever sold in any European country ever was in December 2019 in the Netherlands when they sold over 12,000 cars, which was a huge percentage of their total for that quarter uh, in in all of the European theater. So I don't think that uh, counting, uh, adding to these numbers, uh, the December year-over-year month, uh, will help the the number that I gave you, by the way, the ten percent. That is Tesla's full year number. It's just that the overall market, uh, the overall market, we do not have yet total data from all manufacturers. So the one hundred and twenty three percent year over year. That is the first eleven months of twenty twenty over the first eleven months of twenty nineteen. But Tesla adding all the models together, the X. The Y, sorry, the Y hasn't started selling yet, but the 3 and the S, uh, that is a complete full calendar year over uh, the previous calendar year. The X and the and the S are a little long in the tooth in Europe now. Are they selling any of those? Is it all down to the 3? Oh, it is almost completely dominated by the 3. Keep in mind that in Europe, uh, Nick, they, uh, both the garages and the roads 
uh, are uh, narrower and smaller than what we usually find them in the United States. I mean, if you're driving down the road there in Wales, Nick, and trying to look for the uh, ancestral home of Tom Jones, you're going to find that it's a lot tighter to park a Hummer over there than it is parking it in South Dakota. So uh, you don't really buy the Model S or the Model X very much unless you have a huge property over there. You're buying the Model 3. Now, when the Model Y comes to market, uh, it may not improve for Tesla, right? Because everybody else has all their cars coming to market at the same time. Well, there are a couple of things here that will work in opposite directions. Clearly, Tesla is going to have uh, a good sales number with the Model Y out of the gate. I mean, they start delivering them, I think, imminently uh, within the next uh, you know, few weeks here in Europe. And I have no doubt that the Model Y, with the pent-up demand that should be in place, is going to be rather good for them. But as you also correctly point out, first of all, that'll cannibalize away from the Model 3, just like it did when the Model Y went on sale in the United States and in Canada, uh, Model 3 sales uh, basically went into the uh, floor at that point. And uh, also in Europe, we have that ongoing enormous onslaught of more and more competition that is coming on like a fire hose. So it is not clear how much uh, the Model Y will improve Tesla sales in Europe when it comes out. But I do expect that certainly for the first handful of months, uh, the first quarter, the second quarter here of 2021, they'll get a little bit of a bump from uh, the Model Y. Now, as of today... Uh, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles no longer exists, neither does PSA. They become Stellantis. It's a one single company. Um, how is that going to change what happens in Europe and the United States? Well, given the long lead times of these platforms and these vehicle programs that are average four and a half years from inception to a showroom, um, you know, you have to realize that you know, it's not like they wake up today and suddenly, you know, in a few months, there's a new uh, car there that wasn't planned already a long time ago. So the practical implementation of this will take several years. It'll take uh, almost in the ballpark of four years to fully materialize. So uh, to basically do not expect much on the ground from this. Behind the scenes, however, these two companies are going to collaborate on new platforms. They're also going to pool their resources for emissions compliance. Uh, PSA, of course, being an enormously Eurocentric um, uh, manufacturer, unlike uh, uh, unlike F- FCA, which had its uh, nice, big, profitable businesses with Ram and Jeep, mostly in the United States and North uh, America in general, uh, they they are basically going to drive their compliance with this in Europe a little bit faster than certainly if Fiat Chrysler was doing on its own. Now, I noticed when I, uh, and I know you weren't necessarily prepared for this question, but I noticed uh, looking at some of the vehicle sales, uh, last year, 2009, 20, oh, sorry, 2019, we saw that uh, Ram was almost catching and almost taking over the uh, GM truck brands, and they were almost in second place. But in 2020, they had a huge plunge of 11%, 11% down on 2019 truck sales, and they really had a hard time. Uh, and their factories were closed, yes, but so were General Motors and so were Ford. It seemed to be a really rough year, 2020, for Ram sales. They just couldn't get their act together. What happened there? Because for the American market, this seemed like uh, a truck company that had the momentum there to take second place, and they just misstepped somehow. That's right. So what happened there is that you have to look a little bit upon the history that led up to calendar year 2020. Ram had just come out of two years in which they gained enormous amount of market share. They had they were firing in all cylinders. And then suddenly, you know, GM, which had a pretty tough 2019 and also to a lesser extent 2018, they had an easier set of comparables. So it was easier to for GM that had done finalized uh, their new lineup, not just with the half tons, but also the three quarter and full ton HTs to, to really show a better per, uh, year over year percentage gain than uh, Ram did. Keep in mind that Ford was also down about 12% in 2020 over 2019 in the United States market. So Ram essentially performed within a rounding error of Ford's F-series vehicles uh, for calendar year 2020. So I don't think that in the big scheme of things, when you look at the um, the relative kinetic momentum and history going into 2020 and Ford's performance and the fact that suddenly GM uh, was finally was finally their turn after several years of relative underperformance. I don't think that the 11% decline is really a big deal for Ram, in my opinion.
Okay, interesting to see how the American truck market falls out. Back to uh, electric vehicles. Uh, when you look at the presentations from automakers, their strategy, their product presentations, they now look very similar across the board. Is there really any exciting news coming with electric vehicles, or are we seeing every company saying, yes, we're going to adopt this much electric vehicles, this is what in, what's in our plans, or is there any bright stars in the sky? Well, there's clearly a lot of very exciting vehicles. I think that what we're going to be seeing this year for their first two uh, vehicles from Hyundai and Kia, and they're all new rear wheel drive based platform. I think I'm particularly excited about those, but for that matter, many others. But in the big picture, what's really getting boring is all of these automakers when they uh, give their big strategy statements. I mean, they all sound the same. We're going to have this massive and total transformation into EVs. There are going to be so many of them. We can't even keep track of them and more beyond that. And they all sound so similar. I mean, they all have now said, look, I mean, we're simply going to have to uh, get down on bended knee in front, in front of all the regulations that are being passed first in Europe. Uh, actually, the first was in China, but China has wiggled them forth and back a few times. And then came Europe, and Europe has never let go. And now the U.S., we're just bracing for what the new regulations might become because uh, we don't know yet what they are. These, these are the things that are being negotiated now in earnest behind the scenes. And I think that uh, as early as a week or two from now, we may have uh, – some uh, news on that front in terms of what is being proposed and what kind of legislation will or won't pass uh, Congress. There seems to be very little interest by Americans in buying anything but SUVs and even when it comes to electric. I mean, the Ford mark might be just one of the vehicles that Americans are interested in buying. There seems to be no interest in Leafs and Bolts and, and those type of things. So what's the, uh, what's the plan for electric SUVs to come to market? Because we're all interested in SUVs uh, and we're all interested in, uh, you know, getting into electric only if it meets our family needs. Yeah, so clearly, you know, the, it's going at least up and to the right in terms of there will be more and better EVs and therefore all other things equal, the demand will grow. But you have to put in the bigger context of the fact that the uh, politicians are now mandating enormous amounts of mass adoptions of EVs that are beyond what regular consumers are willing to pay for if the vehicles themselves are not subsidized in one form or the other. And, of course, those subsidies can happen in a multitude of ways. You can tax non-EVs very high. You can give actual cash subsidies or tax credits to those who buy EVs, or you can give them special privileges like carpool lane access. They come in a variety of ways, but there need to be plenty of them right. for the consumer to bite in the U.S., and that's a tough slog still. So they're going to have to come up with some real magic here in order to uh, – get the taxpayer to foot this bill. Otherwise, we're going to have a problem. Yeah, we absolutely are. Anton Wallman, independent investor and analyst. Read the majority of his stuff at the street and seeking alpha. There's probably nobody in this country who knows more about autonomous, electric car and the business. And he is a great person to follow. Make sure that you do read his stuff at seeking alpha and the street because it is very eye-opening. Stand by. We're going to talk more about the Ford Mark E coming up. You're listening to Our Auto Expert. This is our Auto Expert radio show. Over 10,000 people download our Auto Expert podcast and many more stream our Auto Expert podcast. Join the happy listeners via iHeartRadio, Spotify, Pandora app, Deezer, Podbean, CastBox, and OurAutoExpert.com. Hours of endless fun await you. I'm Nick Miles, and this is our Auto Expert radio show. Two million Americans get their automotive news daily from our Auto Expert. Um, I am very intrigued by the Mark E. I do have one on order, but a gentleman who has been driving one for the first time in 55 years. Ford is expanding the Mustang family. Uh, Perry Stern joining us on the phone. Perry, of course, uh, writes for OurAutoExpert.com and as well as MSN Auto. Uh, Perry, have you uh, driven your electric bill through the roof this week? It hasn't been too bad. Uh, I mean, it's, it charges very slowly at a 110 uh, outlet, which is what I have here at home. But it's good enough to bring it back up to a full charge overnight. Good. Uh, uh, but it's, 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 a, it's a great little car. I'm waiting for my uh, proper charger to get installed in the new studio. It's uh, we have a place for it on the wall. It's on order. We just have to uh, get it. Uh, I put a, I'm putting a charge point charger in on the wall. It's just uh, we're just not quite there yet. Went for PGE to get their uh, their digging on. 
Um, so do you have a, a, a proper electric charger or are you just plugging it into the regular 110 outlet? Just plugging it in the 110. And if I were to buy one, definitely would go to the 220 um, because, you know, it, like, for example, yesterday I got back from driving around and it had about 75% still left on the battery. I'm getting about 175 miles to the charge right now. Uh, the EPA says I should be getting about 210 uh, because the one I'm driving is the standard range all-wheel drive. So that's the, the dual motor. Um, so it's, it doesn't, it's not the most powerful version that they offer, but it's still lots of fun. But the, with, a, with about 75% of the battery already charged, it still takes about 12 hours at 110 to get it up to 100%. Do you, um, how much have you been driving it? Have you been running it dry? I haven't run it dry because, you know, it's it's 200 miles or so, 180 miles to go run it dry, and I just haven't had the time. Uh, but I've been running it down to about 140, 130 miles of range left. Uh, but it's it's one of those cars that has enough range that, you know, for a typical driver that, you know, maybe has a commute of 40, 50 miles, perfectly fine. And the best part is, I mean, it's it's so much fun to drive. It, as I mentioned, this isn't the most powerful version. I think for this one, zero to 60 is in around five seconds, 5.2 seconds, which, you know, in modern times, it's no longer fast. Uh, it used to be that was quick. Um, <laughs> but it still, it, it still feels quick. And it's, you know, you get all of that torque immediately. And so even if you're going 70 miles an hour down the freeway, you put your foot down and it moves. And the power just comes on so smoothly and quietly. It's it's just a lot of fun to drive. Um, I'm currently driving the Polestar 2, and uh, it's getting from that 80% to the 100% charge is the hard part. It takes forever, especially on the regular, it does. It does. The regular house plug. Uh, I also, it brings to mind when you mentioned that, that uh, I remember when they, in, you know, they first had cars in, in the world, and there was some some guy that was worried that going over five miles an hour might cause some medical issues for human beings. <laughs> yes, well, we've clearly figured that part out. Um, the interesting thing with this, though, and you know, I remember when uh, I was first told about the Nissan Leaf when Nissan was coming out with the Leaf, that when you have an electric car, you get to charge it, you get to refuel while you're doing other things. So there were a couple places where I had to go to the store. A lot of the stores around here in the Northwest have charging stations outside, uh, some of them multiple charging stations. So I could go plug in my car, go do grocery shopping, come back out, and rather than having to sit at the gas station, the car is charged while I'm in getting grocery shopping. So you can kind of dual purpose your time. Yeah. Uh, well, which is the nice thing about an electric car. The unfortunate thing is the places that uh, that have really good charging stations – are the places that I don't like to go because I spend too much money. <laughs> well, there is that you know, problem. Like Nordstrom Rack and all those type of places, and I come out with going, yeah, well, I probably shouldn't have gone there. <laughs> I think it's, it's getting better, though. I mean, and that's the thing. In order for electric cars to become more uh, you know, accessible you know, for more consumers to get them, because it's still a very small percentage of what people are buying right now. And you really need that infrastructure so that you can charge it wherever you go. So you charge it at work, you charge it at home. Um, because there are a lot of people that, you know, live in an apartment. There may not be a place to charge at home, so they have to charge at work or when they're out and about. And I, I mean, let's be uh, honest, we, we'd much prefer that our boss pays for it than we do, right? Well, of course. And, you know, ultimately it is still considerably less expensive than paying for gas. That, true. Absolutely. Can't argue with that one at all. Never, never can argue with that but, one. Um, but it, it is interesting just to point out, you know, it's not just an electric car that – Ford has done such a fantastic job with the interior on this thing. The display, the interface is probably among the best, if not the best, that I've ever used. Uh, you know, so they really thought it out well. And I have, uh, of course, I have the Bronco Sport, which has a very similar interior, um, a very similar layout, except the screen size is different. But the, oh, the whole phone system is very similar. Um, and using the phone to actually you know, do a lot of stuff with your car is great to be able to lock it, unlock it, all do those things. The, the Alexa integration. Um, it, I don't know how I'd live without that now. It's, uh, well, it's, it's interesting because they have, you know, for a long time it was technology for technology's sake. And now the technology is actually really helpful. I mean, I'm sitting here, I have phone connected to the car 
And I can see that as of about an hour ago, it became fully charged, and I have 175 miles of range now. What are you do- doing? Without having to go outside. What are you doing talking to us on the radio? You'll be out what, you know, burning up. That's your electricity you're going to hand off to someone when the car goes back. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm managing my time nicely. <laughs> yeah. just, you go, and, go and burn up some of that electricity you just put into the car. Uh, it's like refueling somebody else's car for them at that gas station. Uh, I, and exactly. I, th- I think uh, the, the, the financial proposition is pretty good. I mean, $43,000 for this vehicle with a $7,500 tax credit, which will bring it down to about uh, $36,000, is, uh, is a good exactly. price point, right? Exactly. I mean, the one I'm driving is 51 is the sticker price. It's the all-wheel drive, uh, the premium edition, so it's pretty well equipped. Um, but it works as, you know, forget the fact that it's electric. It works as a great sport, you know, crossover. It's got good cargo space. The rear seat has got plenty of room, and it's a flat floor since there's no axle going, you know, no transaxle. Yeah. Um, and it also has an additional trunk up in front. Yeah. Uh, because there's no engine up there. And so there's plenty of storage. It's got the uh, panoramic roof. So even if you're sitting in back, it feels really spacious. Um, so just as a general car, and I think it looks good too. I mean, it, but I have to point out, it's not a Mustang. It says Mustang. And I know that, you know, they're trying to keep it in the Mustang family, but it doesn't, it's fun to drive. It's not fun to drive in the same way that a powerful Mustang. You just heard all the Ford engineers go, oh. <laughs> Last... But it's still a great car. Right. It's still a great car. Final question. Yes or no answer, Perry. Very simple. Would you own one? Yes, definitely. All right. Perry Stern. You can read his stuff at OurAutoExpert.com. Great read. Lots of really good information there at the website or MSNAutos.com. But I favor OurAutoExpert.com. Much better website. Uh, Perry, thank you for joining us. He'll be back again soon with more insight into some of the cool cars he gets to drive. A lot better than I get to drive. Stand by. You can also go to OurAutoExpo.com for all of the other great info. See you next time. You've been listening to Our Auto Expert with Nick Mile. Find all the show episodes at OurAutoExpert.com. Please follow us on all social media, Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Our Auto Expert. And message us for a quick and witty response.